four broad areas this morning, looking at some definitions, spending a little bit of time on this thing called the commons. What about all this thing called the commons? Do we really understand in our neck of the woods what we mean by the commons? Looking at public services, and that will include a look at definitions and also the role of the state. Um, over the last, I think, perhaps two or three years, I've been fascinated and I've been following, and certainly we in PSI also clearly follow and have actually invited Mary Ma Mariana Mazzucato, um, a leading, um, she is described as a leftist economist, um, but she certainly turns things around, she turns things upside down. And in fact, she delivered the keynote address at the 51st annual meeting of the Caribbean Development Bank last week. But I want to go back to something she said in 2013, seven years ago, well, just over seven years ago, about rethinking the state. Because I believe that a lot of the discussion regarding this topic of public goods, commodification, and, and inequality, social justice issues actually revolves around views about the state. And I think Andre made some, um, I'm gonna put in brackets, snide references to the state by promoting the, 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 the what one myth about the efficiencies of the private sector, but we'll leave that for another time. But allow me to read, to foster growth, we must not downsize the state, but rethink it. That means developing, not axing, competencies and dynamism in the public sector. When evaluating its performance, we must rediscover the point of the public sector, and that is to make things happen that would not have happened anyway. In one of her, and I think it was perhaps her um, one of her first books, if not the first, Mariana gave a rather detailed account about the entrepreneurial state, educating many people that the things that we take for granted now, like the internet, NASA, space travel, going to the moon, were actually done through public services. In fact, NASA is a public entity. The internet was an offshoot of the development um, coming out of the space race. So it's important for us to really understand and to pay particular attention to what the state really is. In fact, and, and I, I do think that words matter. So I like to say the state as opposed to government. You know how we in the Caribbean like to say, well, the government this or the government that. And in that word or, or the way in which we pronounce it government, we mean a whole host of things. We don't only mean the institution of government, but we manage to mix up the parties and politics and who we like and who we vote for and who we don't vote for in, in that whole thing called government. So I'm gonna use the word the state. What has happened particularly with COVID-19 and the way in which we look at or, or even reconsider public services is that People have turned most to public services during this epidemic. And I would dare say even, well, I don't even know if there's an after COVID. I, I, I hesitate to talk about post COVID. Let's say in the COVID era. So the things that we value, we've, we've come to sit down and think more about family, health, education, stability, security, and so on. And those are, as we call them, public goods or common goods. The fact that it is the frontline jobs that held things together. And, and let, let's, let's be real, they're predominantly held by women. And these are the workers who are often undervalued, underpaid, and in precarious work. And in, in many cases, particularly when we're talking about the care functions, it's expected that that care function is to be carried out for free. And not to mention the fact that their formal employment rights are often denied. 
So one of the things that we're saying as Public Services International is that when we're talking about this recovery, and everybody now is into this recovery mode when they should actually have been planning for it before. But the discussion around public care services and gender relations must be at the center of this pandemic recovery, and it must be viewed through an intersectional lens. So we have to consider persons with disabilities. We have to consider those who are in um, who, who, um, different sexual orientations. Um, persons, persons who are within all the various degrees, whether it be different races and ethnicities. I mentioned a, a minute or so ago that I believe that words matter, but I, I'd, I'd invite you to think about it. Don't they really matter? And what has been happening over the years is that the kind of narrative that we've been having, particularly by those who are, are the neoliberalists, have actually changed the way in which we understand and view the public service or public services. Words like commons, what, what is it that's the commons? What is about collectivity and collective life and humanity? And we are actually in a situation amongst ourselves within PSI, and as I said, with our uh, um, other allies that believe in social justice, we're actually looking at all of these things, the words, the language used, the way um, certain concepts are developed, the myths that are around. And three things that I think are important for us to think about as we are propelling ourselves towards this recovery. We're in a neoliberal world and that world is pushing that individual freedom and, competitive, and competitiveness is natural. These things are natural, it's natural to be. I mean, if you, if you recall Andre's um, talk about the competitiveness of the telecommunications industry, is it that they're really competitive? I, I think we can have a big debate about that. But at the same time, young people understand the value of solidarity and sharing with others because they are involved in social movements. They do understand these things. So how are these two things in, in juxtaposition? Individualism to a certain extent, but yet recognizing the value of bringing people together and sharing. But then we also know that not only individuals have to be protected, societies also have to be protected. We're seeing the spate of, of, of increased crime of all sorts across the Caribbean and especially being visible now in our COVID era. And, and perhaps, I, I, I'm, I, I'm hesitating whether to call this a cartoon or not, or a caricature of, of what, what we're facing. But this is, this is, this is what we're living with. And, and it, it happens that we're not only talking about large companies, we're even talking about some of the smaller private sector and even some individuals who are operating in private sector spaces. That regardless of all the other things that are going on, the important thing is profit. So profit takes this front stage um, and, and our message in Public Services International is that, is that it is people over profit. So what are public goods? Many, 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 many years ago in my micro econ class, we would have had these, you know, standard definitions about non-excludable and non-rivalrous um, in the sense that it would be costly or, or impossible for a private person or private company to provide these public goods. Um, and, and therefore, one of the aspects of it is that a public good is non-excludable. You can't just keep someone away from, you can't exclude them from benefiting or enjoying that good. The other aspect is that it is non-rivalrous. In other words, it's accessible to all. Someone's usage does not affect the availability to someone else who comes after. 
And that's the standard definition of public goods. And in discussions with colleagues over the last, I would say three, four months, we've been looking at these definitions and trying to determine, is this really the way it is? Have, have we really got it? Are there, what, what are the, the stories behind this? What's been happening over the years in terms of definitions of public goods? And what are they? And you've got this, this kind of matrix where you talk about private goods, then there's some commons or common resources and everybody talks about the tend to always talk about fish and timber and coal and free public transport. Then they talk about those goods that might be excludable, but they're non-rivalrous. So you can have something that is artificially scarce. So you have a cinema, so you, you, you have different fees for people getting into the cinema or public transport or a piece of land, which really should be part of the commons, but it's a private golf course. So to keep some people out, they put some fees on them. Um, amazingly enough, I always say that no matter what they do, certainly people in the Caribbean always find a way to get in no matter how much it costs. So um, we do have a saying here in Barbados yeah. that if it's too cheap, it, it isn't a good. So something to think about. And then there's public goods. So something like PBS in, in the US, your local um, public television stations, um, TTT, uh, CBC in Barbados and so on. Your fire service. Andre mentioned national defense. But then there's also this thing about free and open source software. If we're talking about the whole matter of, of going into technological transformation, basic research, and then herd immunity. Herd immunity is a public good. It's non-excludable and non-rivalrous. Maybe another point to debate. And then there's this thing called the commons. Now, I, I am wondering if Caribbean public understand or identify with this term called the commons. So these are goods that are non-excludable, but rivalrous. So they're called common resources or the commons. And if I quickly look back, this is where we find our commons in this quadrant. And then you hear this talk about the tragedy of the commons. And it said that this occurs when goods are rival but not excludable. And they usually use an example of fishing and say, well, okay, if, if the, the sea is, is commonly owned, but then what happens is people then will go in and they will fish and fish and fish and fish and deplete all the fish. And then you have a situation of the tragedy of the commons. So when someone cannot be excluded from consuming a good, the, the group of economists that, that believe in this and promote this say that then those people have a private incentive to over consume it. So we're just rabid, savage people that we have no no value of family common taking care of one another, public interest, nothing like that. That's basically what they're saying. And then there's a new term that we've been exploring, one that's been um, put forward by a colleague in Europe called the, so I'm sorry, called the social commons. They're not public goods but they refer to the common good, what humans share. And therefore it says that in order to have these social commons, it doesn't exclude the state, it actually does involve the state, but it is collective action and the result of that action. And it is sincerely based on a belief that people can master their present and shape their future within the framework of mutual respect and respect for nature. And that might start to sound familiar. So we're talking about the climate crisis and the way in which people um, are talking about it. 
and, and how they recognize that the profiteers are the ones who are rabid and who have been using up resources all in the name of profit, but that people as people do know how to take stock of things and do want to shape a future where there's mutual respect and respect for nature. So does this in any way apply to the Caribbean or in the Caribbean? Can, can we identify examples in the Caribbean where this happens? And I think that that is something um, that we need to be looking at. Then there's the talk about global public goods or digital public goods. So we're now in this age of digital transformation, digitalization, and there's this thing called the global, sorry, the digital public good. And there's actually a definition and it's been defined by the UN Secret Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. And if I may, open source software, open data, open artificial intelligence models. And I have to remember not to say artificial intelligence open standards and open content that adhere to privacy and other applicable laws and best practices do no harm and help attain the SDGs. So these points that I've raised, and yes, um, the presentation will be available and, and um, the, the college will make it available, I believe, to those who, who request it. These terms, this thinking is one that's occupying our minds, not only within PSI, but certainly within um, the minds of a number of our colleagues and allies. Um, we have a group that's actually putting together what we're calling a manifesto for public services, um, exploring the definitions and the themes and the issues related to public goods, public services, government services, and so on. Now, not all goods with positive externalities are public goods. The argument can be made that education is one such good and service, education services and education as, as a good. So for example, the, the, it is said that having invested in education, there's huge spillovers. So it isn't only um, a situation where it's for the public good, but you do know of instances where education is provided by public companies or public, sorry, private companies or private organizations. And there's this thing about profit that I think we need to deal with in a, in a real way. There seems to be a view that public services don't make profit or can't make profit or shouldn't make profit. I think we have to really dissect that because public services do need to make a surplus in order to sustain and improve. Workers have to be paid decent salaries and wages. There must be training and constant training, lifelong learning for the workers. And of course, there must be a protection of the environment. So a surplus is needed in order to invest, be reinvested into the services, into the communities, and obviously for the workers. And this is very much different from a situation where profits made by private providers are transferred to private stakeholders the shareholders in the company. And I'll let that sink in for a bit. So what is the role of government or the role of the state as I prefer to call it? 
the government is a productive wealth creating organization. It supplies direct utilities as well as aids to private production. And the word utilities there is used in the widest sense of infrastructure and the services. And this was said many, many years ago, I think um, way back in the 1930s by Paul Studensky. Because one thing that I want to emphasize is that what has happened over the years is that the early economists always saw government or the state as a productive entity, not as it is seen now and promoted by many without even recognizing that they're promoting it. But many are now promoting it as this, this um, monster, it would seem, that only comes in when things have broken down and um, okay, so the government gonna fix it and the government gonna find money for it and the government gonna provide and I mean, we've seen it all in this COVID era where when tourism has fallen, the private sector goes to government. If there's a flood or a storm and agriculture fails, the farmers go to government. If manufacturing falls, the Manufacturers Association comes to government and so on and so on and so on. And it is as though the more we say, we make it a life fulfilling prophecy but government is a productive wealth creating organization. And if you even check within your own country of Trinidad and Tobago, state, sorry, of Trinidad and Tobago, and even countries across the Caribbean, we wouldn't be where we are today in the Caribbean in terms of, or the, if we look at the measurements, the established measurements of prosperity based a lot on our social systems, if it weren't for the productive wealth creating organization called government. Because our health, as we keep saying, is our wealth. And in, in terms of the responses and the experiences in relation to COVID-19 um, have come about for a number of reasons. One, the kind of work that has been put in based on or susceptibility or vulnerability in the times of various crises, whether it be a hurricane, a storm, volcanic eruption, those systems were called into play to deal with COVID-19, whether it be dengue, Zika, chikungunya, and so on. The fact that we have our education systems that have allowed for ensuring the ways in which we respond to things. Now, I'm not suggesting that everything is perfect, but what I'm saying is that when you look at other countries, other territories that may be bigger, may have larger budgets, and their response or the ways in which they were able to respond, a lot of it depended on the development of their public services and the way in which their public services were managed. And that includes healthcare. So we do need, I believe, to rethink, turn some of these things upside down in terms of why is it that there is this constant hammering home to us that the state is only there to deal with market failures, it can't produce anything, it's, 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 it's just there to back up the private sector. Um, it's, it's only when things go wrong, you call it in. When we have so many examples, not only in terms of the US, Europe, um, in particular, the ones that we tend to look to in terms of developments, and even within our own countries, we can see examples because it was the um, New Deal in, in the US. It was the whole investment in public services after the war in the UK that helped to build and create wealth in the economies of, of the United Kingdom and of Europe. I, Let me know. Sister Sandra, just checking in, just um, 
you know, looking at, at the time, you know. Yes, how, yes. I'm going to wrap up in, in, in right. a couple of minutes. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Welcome. Public services. I want to switch now to public services and, and throw at you, literally, as I said, you'll have an opportunity to, to look at these things, a number of different definitions. This, this one on, on the screen is my tends to be my favorite because I think it's one that, that people can easily look at and sink in with and understand and grasp some rather straightforward language and so on. But then it's also now looking at public services as systems. And to recognize is that there are systems that deliver what the communities identify as common goods, that they're forms of collective provision, that they're systems of production, and a lot of emphasis on the collectivity, that you're sharing and redistributing resources. It's providing equal access for no or little cost at point of access or point of delivery. It's a sort of a mutual help, solidarity, a form of redistribution. And also the linkage with the direct enjoyment of human rights. Some people argue that housing is not a public service, but remember that water, access to food, um, sanitation, energy, transportation, telecommunications, they're all part of your human rights package. We're talking about vital needs. We're talking about that the fact that these services are provided in the common interest and in the public interest so that they can provide everyone with the access and that they can enjoy them without having to get into rivalry. Another quote from Mariana Mazzucato, by privatizing public goods, outsourcing government functions and the constant state bashing, government as meddler at best de risker, we are inevitably killing the ability of government to think big and make things happen that otherwise would not have happened. So the state starts to lose its capabilities, capacity, knowledge, and expertise. Think about what's happening in your own country, the way in which people continue to bash the state. And therefore you're having a group of young people who do not want to work for the state. They may go in for a bit and say it's a stepping stone. Without brains, all government will be able to do is not make big things happen, but simply serve a private sector that is concerned only with serving itself. And just to wrap things up about how trade unions play into this, Mariana also talks about the importance of having trade unions. They must be there at the table to provide the workers voice to frame the transition to a healthier and sustainable post COVID-19 economy. And finally, sisters and brothers, colleagues, I, I leave you with a quote from our General Secretary, Rosa Pavanelli. It's time for us, and I'll add in the trade union movement to be bold and vocal. It's time for us to call on the labor movement and our allies to have a radical agenda. And PSI is committing itself to broaden the area of public services as a vital claim for a more inclusive, prepared, responsive and resilient society. Sisters and brothers, thank you very much.